So well, I. Oh, please go ahead. Wait, are we actually recording now? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> always a good start. Uh, uh, yeah, that's what I'm here for. Good starts. You know, uh, you always accuse me of bringing our show down into the gutter, but you're the one that's taking us into the sewers today, aren't you? Hey, uh, I see what you did there. Uh, yeah, been waiting for that one yep. all day. Uh, <laughs> you've been waiting all day. You've been waiting a long time to deliver that line. Laughed to myself while I was washing the dishes, and I was like, I'm going to have to remember that. Welcome to The Voyage Podcast, a show that traverses the oceans of myth and legend through the lens of Catholic theology and philosophy. Come aboard as we set sail in pursuit of the heroic life and Christian virtue with your hosts, Mike Schramm and Jacob Platty. <laughs> I'm excited for this episode, man. You know, one thing that you that might makes not one have of known us. about me. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, a, I'm a pretty big fan. Of, of what, Ninja Jacob? Turtles. We haven't even said it. Yeah. Of the, what? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Did you ever, were, were you... Uh, I watched the cartoon. Are you old enough to watch the original 80s cartoon, Mike? Was it 80s you cartoon? I mean, I watched it in the night. I'm, I was Yeah, no, it, it, yeah. it definitely, it, it was 87 and then it went through like 95 or That's something That's a pretty like good that. lifespan though for a cartoon. It's a pretty good run, absolutely. Yeah. We're actually going to, we're going to talk about just how popular like Ninja Turtles always are. Like we we as a culture have kind of like forgotten. Well, a obviously when they first came out, they were huge, right? That was like a cultural phenomenon type thing. Uh huh. Um, but people, I don't think they realize just how devoted of a fan base the turtles have always had ever since then. Uh, I mean, they're not like big news like Furbies or something like that. <laughs> you well, know? so like, I uh, actually it re- it reminds me of. Did you ever see that Netflix show um, docu series called um, The Toys That Made Us? Uh, so I have seen maybe some episodes of it. So I watched the, t- and not because of this show. I actually watched this independently. This was probably, you know, maybe a year, six months ago or so. But uh, I watched mm-hmm. the Ninja Turtles one because um, I remember having the toys too. So, oh, yeah, dude. I remember going to, you know, a place like Target or Walmart and they would just have like the, sh- like the display aisles of, you know, like the toy aisles, right? But there would just be like a wall of turtle figures. And you're saying right? that because there was so many. These characters have you call them all fans. I feel like that's not really um that's not on brand. You should have called them faithful disciples of the uh, <laughs> followers. The turtle followers power. of the turtle weight of turtle power. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there was there was G.I. Joe's and there was Ninja Turtle figures. There would just be like an aisle that was like half. Half of it was dedicated to G.I. Joe's and the other half was dedicated to. And there was just like the sheer volume of like, it was almost like a collector, like like you would collect all these figures because there was like 80 different figurines, right? That were just the different characters that the TV show kept making up in order to sell more toys. Well, <laughs> you know? it's one of those things where, you know, people always talk about um, the... It was like this: the toys in the movies or the toys in the TV show always kind of went hand in hand. Like, did they make the TV mm-hmm. show to sell more toys? Like, the toys came first, or did the TV show come depth, and then they yes. made the toys after? And <laughs> no, the they answer always, to that is is yes. They yeah. made it to sell toys. Yeah, no, uh-huh. that's on the record. That there's another documentary that is, I think it's just called Turtle Power, maybe. Um, mm. But it's literally about the turtle phenomenon that happens, and it goes into the weeds as to like. It's a great documentary if you're interested in this type of thing. But yeah, it was like, we want to sell toys. Now, this is a great, as great <laughs> let's make a cartoon that helps us sell toys. It's, it's very on it's the It's kind of like us in this, right? We're just shilling out uh, comics, aren't we? That's right. That's so, right. No, right? Yeah, we're just comic shills yeah. in a grand tradition of creating right. uh, entertainment to like... You know, our, prop up our corporate overlords yep. and their merchandising. Sell more <laughs> metal knights and... Phantom yep, Phoenix. That's right. You know, they haven't quite gotten into the figurine business yet, but uh, someday. We're getting there. Yep. We're going to get there. Yep. And then there's going to be like 15 different versions of like Metal Knight. There's going to be like 
You well, know? it'll have to be like Metal Knight with his motorcycle, and then it'll have to be yeah, Phantom yeah, Phoenix no. with this type of grappling hook or with the with the um exactly. the cane or well, something. Well, no, so. it'll be like it'll be like Volcano Phantom Phoenix, you know, and he's gonna be in his like volcano suit, so he can like handle the volcanic heat. That hasn't even happened in the be comics like, yet. You're such be, a and then there'll be we're we're getting no, we're he's we're, supposed we're to just be urban out where this is going. He's supposed to be urban. He's like <laughs> there's in, gonna be ice <laughs> there's gonna be ice Phantom Phoenix, and he's gonna have like his like I mean you Chicago know, gets pretty cold, cold so weather. that's probably. <laughs> <laughs> Chicago gets cold, so that's fair. There'll be scuba diving Phantom Phoenix. You in know what Lake, I'm saying? In Lake like, Michigan, right? <laughs> that's that, yeah, absolutely, dude. Just so, you wait, everyone. This so is as, where the story's going. As good as those Just documentaries, those you know, because of course we're going to talk about documentaries. That's not even the reason. The main motivation for this is twofold, right? I mean, obviously it's it's TMNT, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in general, but we both grew up on the, was it 1990 it came out? The original yeah, movie. Yeah, absolutely. The yeah. uh, live action before the, well, after the cartoon. Dude, it holds but, up so well it holds up so well that i'm just gonna say that is an overstatement but <laughs> having, oh, just, having just watched no it way. this weekend yeah oh, i've seen serious? it so yeah it's <laughs> you're you you you're telling it's me fine for nostalgia's that, sake but <laughs> oh no at the end you know what we're gonna talk about this yeah please in today's episode enlighten me on and some by of the end of it themes. i'm gonna disciple you on the virtues of this specific movie and you're gonna become a true devotee, a, a true disciple. Who was your the uh, turtles? Who was your the one that you always wanted to like pretended to be when you played my Teenage favorite, Mutant my Ninja favorite Turtles. turtle? Yeah. Um, I mean, probably Raphael, right? There's, like, it's funny, th- you know. There's this is almost so like a psychological basic. profile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm and I'm a rebel. Go. I'm misunderstood. Who, yeah. Well, who, I who was your favorite turtle? I actually want you to pick which one you think mine is. Are you going to say Michelangelo? Is it Michelangelo, Mike? <laughs> because your name's Mike. Is that it? Or is it because he's the fun party dude? Do I remind? Do I make you think that I was the fun part? So it was. Yeah, <laughs> you called it. I guess we know each other. I guess we know each other too well. Who's basic now, Mike? Who's I, basic now? I Honestly, wonder, though, the only answer that's not basic is if someone chooses Don, Leonardo. I thought you were gonna say Donatello. No, no, because Leonardo's people, like, the leader. He's cool. Yeah. Well, here's this is he's, what I was, this Donatello's is what I was like the like, I'm not like other girls starter pack. Like that's what Donatello. Is. Donatello <laughs> is when like. That's that's when you know now that nerd culture has become cool. That's why you picked Donatello, yeah, but you his, never actually picked Donatello. Well, that's the... not true. You know, honestly, because full disclosure, I used to kind of go back and forth between Donatello and Raphael because Donatello, a he has the bow staff and that's a cool weapon, and uh, Raphael's cool, but his size were like kind of like rude. the lamest weapon. Yeah, <laughs> cool, but yeah, but rude, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Michelangelo, he's a party dude. That's right. Um, Donatello, he does machines. Um, so, but that's what made him cool. He he did machines. So can I back you know? up for like, a second? Because techie. you were going to yeah. give me so much so much of a hard time for choosing. But I think, so if I'm remembering, back in my childhood, dude, I, everyone played, chooses Michelangelo. I played with my older cousin, and I think my older cousin was always Leonardo. And so that's maybe yeah. what I would have gone for because he was the oldest you know, and the leader. You can tell this is an era in which the virtuous noble leader still commands respect amongst children, <laughs> right? I don't think that people would ever choose Leonardo to, because he's such a square. Um, but back, you know what? We weren't so far gone that back in the day, kids could be like, yeah, he's like the most uncorruptible and adept of the brothers. You're, you're too and young. I aspire to be like him. You're too young to look at the gilded past like that. You're, t- <laughs> you're too young to be Dude, nostalgic like that. Time is moving quickly these days. And so what should have took like a century to achieve in culture has only taken about 20 years. So I can look back on the gilded past because the gilded past wasn't that long ago people, <laughs> by today's standards. People are already like, you know, the 80s weren't what everybody thinks they were or whatever and i think that's kind of right but anyway no um, that's totally true so uh should we start off with some of our i i just some of my favorite lines and i know i kind of you know looked down upon it a little bit ago i i mean there were some funny lines that i remember from my childhood from the from the movie or what some scenes that you since it's such a classic why don't you uh share your one of your favorites from the movie. <laughs> one of my favorite lines from the movie? Or scenes um, or, or, you know, scenarios. Well, okay. Um, shoot. Okay, later, we can start there. Like, uh, I think that's... Um, I 
I guess the very first one that actually pops into my head is the scene where Raphael meets Casey Jones. Okay. Um, and they have that kind of like meat cute. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a super, it's like a super macho meat cute yeah. between like two like hyper violence, you know, vigilantes. Um, and it's just funny, the banter that they go back and forth, you know, and, and some of the lines that you wouldn't expect, like this is supposedly a teenager, right? Like Raphael's a teenager, yeah. but they're talking about like cricket. <laughs> Like you gotta understand what a crumpet is to understand cricket. Which, and mean, I'm a 37 year old man, and I still don't know what a crumpet is. So <laughs> evidently, this sewer living turtle do, in New York City, 1980s. Do you did, understand you know? cricket though? Because he was a cultured New Yorker, whereas you know. Oh, is that what it <laughs> that is? That maybe what that might be. It. They get a lot of a lot of stuff gets flushed in the sewers, you know. And some of it is like culture i guess guess. right (laughs) culture got flush in the sewers Well, he's always the one that's the most willing to go out and you know so maybe he's just out in the world and it's a city that never sleeps so he's he's seeing all sorts of people even at night when he can kind of hide his identity so dressed like humphrey bogart (laughs) yeah Yeah. i love his outfit i love i love you know this is a, a type of hyper reality in which like you know and it's obviously a kid's movie but it's like there's a giant turtle in a trench coat and like everyone's like eh of course, there's that one scene when they get in the, like, he, it's towards the end, I think, when he, like, uh, the taxi driver hits him. Oh, no, this isn't the Casey Joan thing. But the taxi driver hits him, and the guy's like, he runs away. Did you see that? And the taxi driver's like, Yeah, it looked like a turtle in a trench coat. Where are you going? You know, he it's, just, like, moves on. It's kind it's, of the classic, day. like, that's New York for you. Like, I know that, yeah, that joke's like, been kind of, you Nothing know, phases New yeah, Yorkers kind which of Which I don't know if that started in the 80s or, you know, it's definitely a cliche now, but. Maybe it was back mm-hmm. then too. I uh, think it still lands, Mike. I thought that was funny when he said that. I so. <laughs> <it's>, uh, <laughs> I do enjoy the scene, and maybe it's because Michelangelo is the one of. But uh, when they're watching the tortoise and the hare cartoon, and they're like, you know, cheering on the the tortoise, <laughs> like, come on, get go, you know, like. <laughs> It's just, yeah. which I mean, it actually reminds me of. Um, so this is on in uh, there was a cartoon in Mad Magazine where. It was the tortoise and the hare race, but in mm. the Mad Magazine version, they had the Ninja Turtles beat up the hare, and that's why the tortoise won. <laughs> so similar. I mean, I don't know which came first. You know who? Well, yeah, which came whom, first? That's a good question. Yeah. I mean, um, the tortoise won, so the tortoise came in first. But well, you know, so I think this movie, for one, one of the ways this movie holds up is actually in the animatronics the practical effects of the turtles in their Mm. suits, because that could have gone so wrong. That could have, I mean, like you're and you know, maybe, maybe you don't feel this way, Mike, maybe this is one of your criticisms, but I think that you forget you're looking at people in, in rubber suits. Like, I think those turtles legitimately feel, I think it was pretty obvious. You were looking at people in rubber suits, Jacob. (laughs) Oh no, really? I mean, I don't, that wasn't even like, that wasn't even like a, oh, it's not realist. Cause it's like, I wasn't expecting realism from a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. So it wasn't even uh-huh. like, oh, I can't get into this because, but anyway, sorry, keep, uh, so you were blown away by no, the uh, effects. Is that, <laughs> I'm just blown away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure as a kid I was, I'm sure as yeah. a kid I was totally blown away. As an adult, I think it's still, it's like you totally just get lost in like, uh, the magic of these, uh you know, anthropomorphized turtles, right? Mm-hmm. Like they, they just kind of, they play well on the screen, I think. Yeah. So, it's um, fine. <laughs> oh, it's fine. You're going to be a great, you're going to, this is going <laughs> to, it's going to be a great, uh, you know, person to bounce my enthusiasm off of <laughs> in this episode, Mike. Hey, we, we have to, it's like a odd couple sort of scenario. So, yeah, it is right. Is um, this how is this how you felt when I was going into the Spider Verse? Something like is this, that. Yeah. Is this, this your is payback. vengeance for? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, um, so well, let me let me just go before we move okay. too far past it. Okay. I I want to address this Ninja Turtle phenomenon. What I'd begun to say earlier was that they're perennial, perennially popular, right? And I don't think that people kind of realize how popular they still are. Obviously, it's not like this kind of cultural moment like it was when they first landed. But like, for example, there's an IDW comic series that is awesome. Like it's it's really, really great comic writing. And it's a great comic series. And it's been going on for 
almost 10 years now, Mm -hmm. I think, right? Like it's, in other words, it's got enough popularity that it's not going by the wayside. If you'll, one thing you'll notice about all of the, like the cartoons that have come out, because there's always a Turtles cartoon on and, you know, people Mm -hmm. might not realize that, but it's true. And they always last for like many seasons. It's like whatever, whatever medium Turtles get used in, they, they have longevity, which speaks to the fact that there's like a dedicated fan base that really falls in love with these well, stories that are being told. I mean, told, yeah, besides you know? the movies that we, because there was a second and a third one, there was the cartoon that we both kind of grew up with or whatever. But then um, there was what, one, two, or three, maybe just two Michael Bay um, teenage two movies. Two Michael Bay movies. There's like a Ninja Tur- yeah. uh, I'm sorry, Nickelodeon uh, cartoon for a couple of, and I think which there's is been evidently- one or two iterations of that. I've only I've only seen a few episodes of the CGI Turtles cartoon, mm-hmm. and it seemed fine. It seemed decent, but I haven't. Which you know, for a certain fan base, is going to sound like blasphemy because that's evidently like an extremely well done, like well crafted show. And that's the other thing that I want to point out is the reason why these different stories have longevity and like develop a fan base is because they tend to be of an unusually high quality for children's entertainment. Mm-hmm. Like it, it, the fans come back because the, it's almost like the story. I don't know. Maybe the stories like write themselves, right? Like there's so much, there's so much kind of mythos and I in think, the turtle universe and so much to draw from. And when you have, you know, four very different, which that's the whole point is that you have four very different characters. You can, you know, have the personalities play off of each other really well, or you can have two of them go on. A, it's like you, you get a lot of options there when you have, um, you know, they're not, they're, none of them are flat. And in, in some ways we were kind of joking about how some of them fit into tropes, which of, of course they do, right? Every character is going to fit into certain tropes, but they, it gives them, or there's a lot of room for them to, you know, and, and maybe it has to do with the setting too, where it's like, oh, there's so many different kinds of characters in New York, or you're going underground. So it's almost like you're going into fairy world when you go into the sewers or something well, like that. Well, even more so than that. Uh- like they're also crazy, <laughs> like not the characters, the the turtles, but like the stories. Uh-huh. Because people, if if you only have like a passing like you know understanding of the turtles, or you only kind of seen them in like their most popular forms, like the '80s cartoon or the the '90s movies or whatever, um, you don't realize just how wacky the adventures they go you, on actually, it's actually are. They kind of do like a multiverse thing before anybody, because they have Dimension X, right? And so, they do. They have the well. It's not. Don't even give me st- like so. In the two thousand three uh, incarnation of the turtles, they cap that with a TV film, which full disclosure I haven't actually seen, but I am aware of it. In which they multiverse, like they meet their eighties versions of themselves. Oh, cool! Like they they embrace the reality because there are like there's like so many different versions of turtles. Even by two thousand like seven, when the movie came out, this cartoon movie I'm talking about, and they they implicitly acknowledge that all those different versions exist, mm-hmm. right? So it's kind of like a pre Spider Verse kind of thing going on. But yeah, they're they're multiverse hopping like Dimension X, where like the Utom the the Krangs, right? The yeah. brain creatures live. Um, they uh, there's Triceratons, <laughs> which are these dinosaur aliens that are, are all Triceratops. As a matter of fact, hmm. um, it, they they go to outer space all the time. Like it's a frequent. You know, you know how in Spider Verse there's like canon events. Yeah. What's really funny about all these different versions of turtles is like they actually they have like canon events. Like Splinter always has to get kidnapped. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like in, in rescued, the the turtles always have to go through this kind of like, you know, well, maturation, maturation. Because they're, teen, they're teenage, so they always have to show yeah, a coming and they lose of age their father sort of element, figure, and they have to, which yeah, actually exactly. came up in the movie too. Which um, when they go which off is to what that cabin, it's going to happen in this movie. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So let's 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 get to the movie uh, because the movie, spe- uh, you know, I've been waxing on about all these different versions of the turtles, and maybe one day we'll do an I'm episode letting, where we get into some of the details. I'm letting you get it out of your system, basically. <laughs> there's there's so many cool details in some of these other versions of Turtles, right? The IDW comics are, like, super legit. Well, and but, uh, part of what inspired this, too, is that the... So by the time this comes out, the uh, new Teenage Mutant right. Turtles movie will have come out the previous week, is what we're kind of... Is, is sort of what we're yeah. thinking, so... Yep, so there, we're, be we're another, doing it just because there's a Turtle movie coming out. Yeah. And there'll be, yeah, there'll be another interpretation, which I'm like and cautiously optimistic about it. TMNT, the, you know, points us towards the the true, the good, and the beautiful. And that's also the motivation, right? 
we're going to see this is this is where I'm going to bring you into the fold, Mike. Uh-huh. The the Ninja Turtles are a great great opportunity, especially this movie in particular, to talk about the Christian life, right? Because it's and I'm going to discipline myself. So and splinters, bring us splinters into cane the might as well be a shepherd's crook is what you're telling me right <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> might have a little it might as well be yeah it might as well be um so this movie and here's the reason why i wanted to talk about this movie in particular because it's probably the most like uh, perfect distillation of this theme that i want to talk about where um this is this whole mythos the ninja turtles mythos is very much a good versus evil type story right sure um and it's very much about converting people from evil to good like it's always it, you know there are so many characters in ninja turtles that like start out bad and then become like allies of the turtles right mm. um and so but the main foundation for all that is this kind of didactic you know didache style two ways yeah right um that is laid out you have the example of splinter and his protégés, the turtles, and you have the example of their arch nemesis Shredder. Even Splinter and his foot was clan. a sort of apprentice. Splinter was, and he too, was too, um, right? And I'm forgetting his masters because I always think Arokusaki was Splinter's or Shredder's name, right? That's but right. What was Splinter's uh, master? Hamato Yoshi. Yeah. So my master Hamato Yoshi. So even he um, kind of had that too. He did. So you know, one of the things. Um, all right, let's put a pin in that because I want to talk about Splinter in depth. In in depth, but uh, first I want to like lay the foundation for okay. like this world, right? And that is New York City, specifically New York City of like the 1980s and early 90s, right? Yeah. And you know, this is coming out of like the 70s. This is coming out of like the dark era. Like there's a there's a kind of dark ages in New York City. Um, where all the gritty crime films are coming out because it's a reflection a reflection of like just how like bad things got for New York City denizens in like the 1970s, yeah. right? Um, and there's like a trash, there was like a trash, um, uh, what's it called? They stopped picking up trash. Oh, like so the whole world, strike? like New York, there was a strike. Yeah. yeah. And so like, you know, you're talking about uh, one of the most populated cities on the planet and there, no trash is being taken out. The gangs are super rampant. It's just like a world of like disgust and violence and um, so every, grittiness. Everybody's right? sick, Literally of, sick of grittiness. all the rats. And what do they do? They say, hey, we're going to make a rat the good guy. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> we're going to make these well, pests. You know what? There's there's something redemptive there. Am I right? Mm-hmm. You know? Um, Feels like propaganda, but okay. That's... <laughs> Was this pr- was this funded by the city of New York? Like, hey, the rats are actually. You guys are complaining. The rats are good guys. See, yeah, right. See, here's an example. Look at this wise this one. turtle accolade. This, this wise yeah. rat. Um. So, you know, that's the backdrop for the idea that there is this like invisible menace that is like represents a a more profound evil than just like the crummy gangs that are are kind of like ruining people's lives. It's like a it's like a um fertile soil for a more menacing evil to actually start to like instant instantiate itself and and be this kind of like force behind the crime, right? And that's what the Foot Clan is within the context of this movie. And there's a scene uh this moment when April O'Neil is uh reporting on it where she refers to it as like an invisible crime wave. Mm. And well, what I want to pick up on that is the idea that in s- the spiritual life, we're in a kind of warfare, right? Spiritual warfare uh, in our hearts, right? And in the world itself, where we wrestle against principalities and powers, right? And, you know, what St. Paul says is like, we're not, we're not wrestling against like the authorities, the, the physical material authorities in our lives. We're, we're wrestling against the evil invisible forces that are behind those authorities, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so the idea that the Foot Clan is this like clandestine ninja invisible force for well, criminality, And that's right, the thing is that plays into this even idea. the physical characters, by, by having them be ninjas, they're supposed to be, you know, unseen, right? Hidden. Mm-hmm. And so it kind of plays into, like you said, the invisible part of the crime. Wave. Not just, I mean... You're talking invisible in terms of like spiritual, but mm-hmm. they're they're trying to kind of manifest that in their own, you know, 
in in their own yeah, person. Yeah, the allegory is that this is like it's it's literally an invisible crime wave. Like you know, yeah. it's a, it's it's you can't see it. You know the effects of it, right? People are losing their wallets and things like that. But like no one knows where it's coming from. It's just like things are just like disappearing. You know. To comedic effect, like that lady watching the TV set, like in her <laughs> fire escape. She turns and all around, it's like, yeah. where'd my TV go? You know, like, uh, kind of thing. Um, and so it's interesting the movie actually, the movie lays all this out first before you get anywhere yeah, else. This is and all in even, like the first like two minutes. They're doing this kind of sit, to absolutely. The stage. Yeah, this is, and I'm trying to think, do they even, when do they go to the warehouse? Like the kind of pleasure island of this universe, you know that oh, yeah. that thing from um, Pinocchio, yeah, where all the kids are, they go and they're promised well, like they're nothing like, but pleasure. It's like they're, but then they turn into when they have like the new recruits, and they right. kind of are initiating the new recruits. I, you know, I didn't do a time. That's stamp. really early. I couldn't, I couldn't yeah, that's tell really you if early it was in like the film in too, thirty though. minutes in or forty minutes in. I couldn't remember exactly, but yeah, I mean, it's it is relatively early because I think that's when we that's when we see the initiation. And is it also where Shredder does that whole like monologue about family that I think you were one of the things that uh, yeah you really I'm going to get well into? yeah we'll get into that next basically what I just want to clarify here is that the movie does a lot of work to set up this kind of you know whatever kind of dystopian nemesis this kind of like criminal activity that can't be fought because it can't be seen and it it really it really emphasizes like the corruption that's at work like within the youth. Mm -hmm. So it sets up the villainy so that the turtles can, you know, be juxtaposed against it, right? So before you even get to a whole lot of knowledge about who the turtles are or anything like that, you you are shown all the bad stuff first, yeah. right? And then when you do finally get to Splinter and his turtles, they're these kind of beacons of like fun and hope and goodness basically. Um, and it's it, what's nice about the Ninja Turtles is that like the ninja thing kind of really signifies this ascetic life, this life of like dedicated discipline, right? On both um, sides, right? Because that's even discipline. And they both, yeah. it, and we're, we'll get that one because there's the, this an inversion. There's like an antichrist type thing going on yeah. between Splinter and Shredder. Um, but like uh, with the turtles, you have the joviality of their teenageness combined with the asceticism of their ninja-ness. And you have a great balance. Well, you basically have, you know, they didn't become those awesome ninjas by like reading comics and eating pizza. So another part but of the- But they have both. Another part of the inversion is that most of these foot, these foot, the part people in the Foot Clan, they are sort of like wayward teens. And so you kind of have like the teenagers on one side and the teenagers on the other, right? These and things very much mirror Even each though other. in one sense, you know, the Ninja Turtles are orphans in a sense, right? They are adopted by, yep. by Splinter. These other ones, whether they are actually orphans or they at least feel orphaned or alienated like teenagers often do from their family. And they're, like you said, it's, it's the, the way of life and the way of death. And right. so you kind of see, and again, they're trying to kind of paint this picture of these two groups, right? Obviously, one's a set of mutant turtles and one's regular people, but they're supposed to be going through these very similar experiences of, you know, coming of age, and yet they're going in very different directions, at least at the start. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost Manichaean, frankly, but, like, there's a lot of Christianity in this. It's, it's this is the two ways of the Dadake, like mm -hmm. what you were just bringing up. And then, like, the fact that they live in the city, it's almost like the catacombs of Rome. So okay. much of, like, New York City of the 70s and 80s is like a new Babylon. <laughs> it's like this Roman decadence, right? This huh. kind of corruption. And this is like the militant church in the catacombs, like, underneath, you know, all, all the despised people, like mutant turtles, for example, have to, like, live underground, but they're the ones that are fostering, like, the true way like the way of spiritual discipline, right? Um, and and fun, right? It's important uh, to emphasize that they don't conflict with each other. Um, whereas like the fun that's being had by like the Foot Clan acolytes and all that stuff at that like Pleasure Island style warehouse, that's like a corrupting, like uh, it's not a wholesome fun. See? It's like a, it's like a, a, your passions unleashed kind of fun, yeah. right? And and then when you get lured in with all of that entertainment, all of that lack of discipline, then you get shepherded into where there will be the discipline, right? Where there will be the 
the cruelty, frankly. Yeah, I because mean, because the discipline that these people undergo is not like a, it's not like a fatherly discipline. So it's more like a, I'm going to turn you into lethal. We've sucked you in with this other stuff, but now you owe us something, and you're going to pay and us. When back you have no by, soul left, you know, we're going to rebuild you up in what we want you to be. Right. Um. Oh man, I was just thinking of some. Ugh. Shoot, I was just thinking of something else, but uh, anyway, we'll just keep going. Um, so, um, and, and then one last thought on the turtles before we leave. I don't think it's a coincidence, even though ironically it is kind of a coincidence. If you go into like why the turtles were named after Renaissance artists, yeah, um, the authors of the original, the original creators, uh, Eastman and Laird, they, um, they, they're like, well, we just didn't want to name them Japanese names. We didn't think people would like it. <laughs> so we're like, uh, we'll use these Renaissance it, artists. Italian instead. is exotic enough. Is that, and, yeah, well, yeah, I was it's like, like this quasi exotic. So it's like Renaissance Italian, then they also are obsessed with pizza. I'm thinking that maybe these Ninja Turtles are, it's like a nod mm, to Rome. They, like maybe they come there's a from, little bit of a. Uh, they're, they're just from like the Italian like ghettos in New York, I guess, right? So like are the, the Ninja Turtles Catholic, is what I think is what the question everybody wants to know is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, was was the ooze, is, ooze, is the ooze a valid baptism? Like, is there enough water uh, in the ooze for. <laughs> Ooh, hey, that's kind of a, you know, is the ooze a baptismal element? We're going to explore that in a future episode. Oh, because please. That's pretty interesting. <laughs> okay. yeah. Oh, very interesting. Oh, great. What have I done? Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but like the fact that they are named for artists, I think really um, dovetails nicely into a Christian ethic of like beauty is what saves the world, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, these, the names that are given to these turtles uh, represents you know, these high levels of like beauty, um, done in the service of Christendom, frankly, you know? Um, so I remember the thing I was going to say, an interesting you, were, point. you were contrasting the two groups and the, like the, the raucous, you know, chaos, but think of, even though the, the Ninja Turtles are known for being very like light and fun, think of how many scenes I can think of at least two separate scenes where they were called to meditate. There were multiple times where, this mm -hmm. this fun it's not contrasted with the meditation it's almost like it's supplemented like the two are absolutely not, like like you were saying it's more chaotic um almost like the pandemonium scene of uh paradise lost if you remember like what that pic of john milton's picture of hell and pandemonium and chaos and stuff whereas now the turtles are having fun but it's paired with the meditation that even though at first it's more like they're kind of, they groan about it because Splinter's making them. But later on in yep. the movie, uh, at least Leonardo, I can think of, does it himself. And it's well, a Well, they pivotal, have those tools in their point. tool belt. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they can, they've internalized it. Yeah. But again, it's just, it's not at the expense of joy, mm -hmm. right? The Christian life, we're supposed to be happy warriors. You know, we're supposed to not worry about tomorrow and let tomorrow worry about itself. Um, you know, we're just supposed to stay disciplined in what we're supposed to be, stay disciplined in, and that's supposed to be an easy burden for us, mm. right? So, you know, we, we we don't have to be dour, right? And the Ninja Turtles are a good example of like a highly disciplined collective that also has a lot of fun with each other, like in the in the safety of their family unit, you know. So, um, this is all well contrasted by Shredder. Let me point out that Shredder's name to Shred. To tear apart, scatter. Yeah. Where have we, where have we heard that before, kids? Mm -hmm. What, who else do we call someone who tears things apart? Is this rhetorical? Or do you want me to answer? It's Diabolos, <laughs> the scatterer. Diabolos, yeah, the, scatterer. yeah, the devil. So you definitely the get a, a very common. I mean, which I mean mm -hmm. that that scene definitely comes up a lot in the Gospels too. Is that the idea of scattering or separating or you know or shredding? I guess. Absolutely, absolutely. You know why not? Why not? Um, and then, you know, uh, it's like, well, what does that make splinter? And I mean, I might be stretching here, but it's like, but you know, a splinter that is to be shattered, right? Like that okay. to splinter is to be like, have been broken. Right. Okay. And so I'll see, uh, that's, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to say that I'm going to say that splinter well, represents someone who's been broken. See, I thought, cause like when, but in like, like a, a splint, like a splint is something for repairing too. Oh, okay. But. See? Like we're stretching, we're stretching, I mean, but definitely with Shredder. Yeah, I didn't know you were gonna bring up the splinter <laughs> none thing. Of this, so I was trying. None to, of this is I'm a trying stretch, to like throw though. you Everything a rope. Everything I've said up until this moment <laughs> is very textual. This is all very it's all not canon. hard to. It's all canon. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, and then, you know, so like, you know, Shredder, he's leader of the Foot Clan, which is just like, you know, what he like, like Jack Boots, Trample you know, underfoot. Like, you know, Trampling underfoot. Trample underfoot. Yeah. Right. So it's this symbol of like just power and like tyranny, basically. Right. Mm. Um, but at the same time, the words that come out of his mouth, like that a big initiation scene in this movie where he's giving this big speech, you know, it's kind of like your introduction to Shredder. Yeah. And he says like, you know, effort, discipline, loyalty, you know, I am your father now, you know, like he's saying these things that are like good words, but we know that well, they're, it's very megalomaniac, like cult of personality, like, you know, trying to be a, he's a, trying to be a tyrant. Yeah. He's coming to them as like an angel of light, quote unquote, uh-huh. by promising them family, right? But his family is just something of destruction. It's just a facade for like self destruction and like the destruction of the world around them, you know? Mm. Very different from Splinter's approach to his like children, right? Um, and so uh, when you get to contrasting Splinter with Shredder, um, you know, he uh, has a lot of parallels to Christ, right? Frankly, and they, especially in this movie, they do that in the movie. Yeah, definitely. You know, like I don't want to steal we'll your just, thunder, so I'll let you do them. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it's 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 like the most obvious example is like when he's literally taken in by the forces of evil, and he mm-hmm. goes through this kind of like passion, right? Yeah. Where like he's hung, he's hung up on a chain link fence, but his his arms are stretched out, kind of. He he's almost cruciform. Right. Mm. And it's actually in this p- part of the movie where he starts to have like these influences on the broken family that like have been gathered to this like den, you know, well, we haven't this talked hellish, about this hellscape. One of the main like kind of like you call him the repentant thief. But Danny, who is at first, I thought it was April O'Neill's like stepson or son. You know, I couldn't quite. But mm. then it's, it's her boss's son it's her boss's kid yeah and she's just a bystander yeah which i mean i feel like there's maybe an inappropriateness to the working relationship but we'll just you know chalk it up to the 80s <laughs> they sure do but just any, show up to yeah, each other's apartments say, like willy-nilly like, like they have keys this, to each but, other's apartments like but you know. we're gonna look past um, that for right now uh he, it's almost like he comes with the with the um the wine soaked sponge or he comes with the water right he brings the water to this you know he does to the crucifying yeah. uh splinter there's that scene you know, it's easy to say that Splinter is like a Christ figure, but I think that really the best ex- the best way to understand Splinter is that he's actually just like a saint, like a spiritual father with disciples in the Christian tradition. He's more like a um, you know, confessor. He's, well, he's more like a and it's person who embodies Christ, who lives out like he walks the road of Christ yeah. and ends up crucified for it. Yeah. Right? But he's not Christ himself, right? And, you know, maybe Hamato Yoshi is kind of like more of like who the Christ figure is, even though the movie doesn't really talk about him too much. But Jesus takes on that mentor role with the apostles, so it's not like it's entirely... I mean, and he is modeling a lot of these things, including his sacrifice, like, and so that that becomes the model for them, for the Ninja Turtles, you know, later on in the movie and stuff Well, like, every good... Every good Christian, like every true example of Christianity, those lines are really supposed to blur. Yeah. Right? Like, we're supposed to become Christ. Yeah. And so, you know, it doesn't mean we're all going to get crucified, but it might, you know, and a lot of times, especially back in the early days, it did, well, right? And it's supposed and to so be a And so Splinter is self, like certainly. that. Yeah. I mean, every, every mm-hmm. saint, you know, has to go through a purgation, whether it's in this life or the next life. And so... Yeah, in the sense that we are part of the body of Christ, we go through, you know, we're taking up our cross and following him. So it's, it's yeah, it's not supposed to be an either or, definitely. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you know, ultimately he doesn't die, right? So like he gets crucified on the fence, but like he doesn't actually. So it's he's not like a one-to-one parallel for Christ, but he is a true but, example of, of how the disciple follows Christ. And, and to go back to our hero's how his journey, life works. it doesn't yeah. all have to be a physical death just to go through a descent into the underworld, right? Exactly. So it doesn't, because that whole scene, him being brought back to that warehouse, it is a descent into the underworld, yeah. right? Full stop. So it's, you know? it's following a hero's journey. I mean, maybe different characters because there's kind of like five heroes if you think of like the four turtles and Splinter. I mean, Casey Jones, who we haven't talked about yet, April O'Neil, they definitely play different parts along that hero's journey too but no it never has to be a physical die and then physical resurrection in the actual story right and they can still kind of play that um be that hero figure or that christ figure 
Well, absolutely. And I mean, so for example, Raphael, he he goes through a kind of death too yeah. in the film, right? Raphael, so if you have Leonardo as like the dutiful son and you have Raphael as like the prodigal son mm. and Donatello and Michelangelo, they're kind of just there to like bounce off those two. All the all the Ninja Turtle stories are often, you know, kind of like the dynamic between Leonardo and Raphael hmm. and the Donatello and Michelangelo. Um, they almost kind of play a supporting role to it. I, I don't want to speak too strongly about that because every turtle gets his moment to shine in all kinds of different stories. But like the real tension, the dramatic tension is always between Leo and Raphael. And we're just dealing right? with this movie primarily anyway, so we don't have to worry And it about- is just this movie. Yeah. So within, yeah, within the context of this movie, you know, Raphael, he becomes this kind of prodigal son and he goes out into the world you know, remember we're talking about New York City as like this stand in for the world full of invisible forces that wreak evil on you. Right. And uh, he loses his discipline. He goes out into the world and he gets beat up. He gets beat up for it. He almost gets killed for it. Right. So much so that he he becomes comatose and, you know, he has to get rescued by April and his brothers. Mm. By this point, uh, Splinter has already been kidnapped so he's not there so this is this part of the movie where like the turtles have to actualize um come together and be a family and you know accept the return of their brother who's on the brink of death uh and april o'neill is there and and we're going to talk about april o'neill because i think she's kind of an interesting character um and of herself but for the most part they have to have that maturation moment that we were talking about earlier Hmm. where they have to come together and um put their their father's teachings into practice, you know, and they save Raphael because of it. Right. Um, well, yeah, I was kind of looking at, so, um, you know, I, I made a joke that cause there is a line where they almost like when they see her on TV and they start kissing the screen, even though they, it, it comes off overtly as like romantic, but it kind of makes me think of like, they're trying to find their mommy sort of. They're like and, venerating, almost like venerating well, like, like an, an icon. icon. Oh, that's funny. I didn't, yeah. But like, <laughs> it came out very much like, you know, like just the way that, that kids can be with their moms, you know, where they would just want to give yeah. them so much affection. It just, it, like I said, them right. not having grown up with any sort of mom, that became their surrogate mom um, in, the, in the movie. And uh, there is something to that. And I, I hadn't thought more about the, you know, owning the antique shop and how she really doesn't want to keep it, but it's, it's because she feels this pull by, you know, her past by her dad and how, um, matriarchal figures become this sort of like connection to, to the, to the heart of the community, to the past of the community, or they're the, they're the ones that in a sense, keep the traditions alive you know, whether it's absolutely so they, they hold the home, they hold the home together. The hearth. Yeah. And so she kind of becomes that for them. Right. She does. And in so many real ways, too, you know, like when I was like thinking through this movie at first, April O'Neil, like um, within the context of this conversation, wasn't making much of an impression on me because I was so focused on the spiritual warfare that the turtles exemplify between Mm. their ways and Shredder's ways. But then it's like the more I think about April O'Neil's role, she is she's almost like this this linchpin for the whole movie. You know, all of the exposition She's like the basal exposition character of this movie, you know, or like a Greek chorus almost. You know, it's, it opens with her delivering narration, setting then, the stage for the world. When they're at the cabin, you know, as a news it's reporter. like she's journaling, you know, and it's a, so she's giving. And then at like, the cabin, she's journaling the stories, like the inner, the inner, inner life. Um, struggles that the turtles are, dem- you know, she's giving voice to it. So she has this kind of Greek chorus role, but she's mm-hmm. also like almost like this Beatrice type character too, right? Because she's like an inspiration. The turtles are always like, they're always reacting to her. Right, whether it's saving her from like the Foot Clan, or whether it's just like seeking her approval, right, or just like being like in love with her in this kind of teenagey kind of way, yeah. Like uh, she's this kind of like, you know, this Beatrice type character for them, kind of, you know. Um, You're just trying to fit but, Dante into everything, and that's supposed to be my job. I, I'm that's going through. I'm going through the Divine Comedy these days, and so I'm seeing lots of parallels. Oh, okay, so <laughs> I'm just finding you're a, you're a hammer, and everything looks like a nail everywhere. right now. Yeah, I get everything it. looks I, like a divine comedy. I get it. I, you know what? <laughs> if there are worse things that you could use to be a cultural touchstone, and so the divine comedy um, is definitely yeah, excellent. Example. I know. See, I I threw that in there for you, Mike. Uh-huh. You know, it's um, it's one of the best. Yeah, for sure. I was, 
it goes, you know, so this, that's where my thoughts were originally with April O'Neil. But then I was like, for funsies, I looked up like what her name means. Uh-huh. And, you know, her name means like descendant of the champion or like a, 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 a ancestor of champions. In, like, right? in Irish, right? And, o is always in Irish. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and okay. she's got the antique shop. You know, well, so she's like a guardian of the past. Well, in April, you know? I mean, April is the the month most associated with spring and with new life and yep. with Easter too. So you've got that kind of. I mean, there's lots of interesting little parallels with her, and, yeah. and so she kind of is this kind of guardian of uh, a culture. Because remember, we're in New York City, like we're in the world, we're in this like corrupted place. And where do they have that's, to go? That's still reeling from the '70s, and and well, real, before we get there. We're in the world, but in the world, there's this little antique shop. Yeah. That is the home of this April O'Neil character. And so she she is both like the Greek chorus of the show, but she's also kind of like the hearth, the home. That's like the closest the, thing the, you the, can get to a church, right? Is by having this really old yeah, place that sells it old is. stuff. That's right. Until That's right. She's we go transcendent. To the closest thing you can get to for a monastery, which is the farm outside of the city. Right, absolutely. They have to chop some wood. Her farm. They have to. She, it's it's you know she brings them out of the worlds into the wilderness, uh-huh. right? Um, into the into the farm an upstate. You know, they brought the turtle to a farm in upstate New York. It reminded like, me um, of, of <laughs> Avengers: Age of Ultron because that's what they have to do. You know, they go to that like yeah. to uh, Hawkeye's farm. That's what I kept Hawkeye's thinking. farm. But that's so funny. I mean, well, you know, turtles did it first. I know, yeah. They beat they beat the Spider Verse and they beat the Avengers. Avengers so. at their own end game. Uh, ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can't even close on that. We got like ten more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we, we let's throw Casey Jones in the mix quick. Yeah, uh, Casey oh, Jones sure. is funny because going, yeah. he he doesn't he doesn't um because he becomes an important part of the farm scene. Uh, this is his this is his moment, his evolution. Because up until that point, Casey Jones is he's like a neutral, right? Like he's in the world, he's of the world, but he's fighting bad guys. Yeah, but so he's kind of like my noble pagan um in this situation. Yeah. He's he he doesn't belong to like he doesn't truly belong to the way of good, as exemplified by the turtles and splinter. But he certainly is at war with like the vile passions as exemplified by but just not according to wisdom. Well, and right? it's funny. He's got a zeal not according to wisdom. Because when you brought this up too, I made that joke. The one joke that I remember from the movie, and it kind of fits with what you were saying, where he kind of has this ignorance to him, this like, uh, uh-huh. where they're like, he's claustrophobic. And he's like, whoa, I haven't looked at any dudes. You know, like, he, <laughs> I never even looked at another guy. Yeah. yeah. He, <laughs> so he lacks that. Like you said, he, he kind of shows that ignorance in kind of like a goofy way, right? Because he's yeah. kind of comic relief. But like you said, he has a noble heart, right? Um, he does. And he goes through this kind of like he's not the main story at all within this film. Uh-huh. But when you think about what his journey is, he totally goes through this kind of redemption arc where he starts out kind of like, you know, zealous, but not according to wisdom. Uh, he meets Raphael as a prodigal. Right. But like, well, he, I guess he's technically not prodigal at that point. He kind of is. But like, uh, you know, that's his first introduction to the wisdom, well, you know, that the turtles represent. And then eventually he gets caught up with them and brought out to the farm. He actually goes in where and he helps has... him when, when Raphael is on the roof and he's attacked by the Foot Clan. Casey Jones sees him and goes over there. So he's kind yep. of, you know, that courage and that um, just fight for what's good for justice compels him. And you were saying how he kind of has to go through this um, humbling of himself, Casey Jones does. And doesn't he have a moment right. where... Well, yeah, it's actually when he makes the joke. He doesn't want to go into the sewer. Sewer. He doesn't want to go down into, you know, what it takes to be a part of this family, to be a part of this group. And that's when he makes the claustrophobic joke, or when the claustro- claustrophobic yep. joke is made. So there's that scene. He has to cross that threshold, which is actually a big moment for him, right? And when it comes to, yep. I, I can't be my own person. In order to be a part of this group, I have to go down you know, into the, which I mean, it's gross, right? I mean, he's a, you know, he knows as yeah, well as everybody how gross it is. Yeah. And I would say like, technically that scene takes place after the farm sequence. And so it's a little a chronologist. Um, okay. But you know, but the themes still stand. I hear what you're saying well, there. And the um, growth isn't all at one, like it's, you know, that's true. Like you said. That's true. 
Well, and so you can call it eucatastrophe because it's because he's unable to bring himself to go into the sewers that he ends up in the truck and he sees the Foot Clan. Then that actually leads to the final culmination, the final confrontation. Mm -hmm. So it's his rejection of going into the sewers that is this kind of eucatastrophe kind of like opportunity for a final confrontation between good and evil which so uh, that's kind of interesting which is kind of a so you know we we contrasted this like going down and going up because where does the final confrontation happen up on the roof up on a roof and so that we kind of have i mean i keep bringing in like hero's journey like you know sort of stuff but uh we have sort of apotheosis going on here with this climax you're right and it's taking place Hmm. as a at a physical climax and we've had that we've done this episode Actually, I don't think we've released it yet on mountains and the spiritual significance mm-hmm. of mountains sure. in the Bible and in mythology and all that stuff. And so we have what's the closest thing to a mountain in New York City? You have, you know, it's not a skyscraper, but it's in the top of an apartment building where at you can the top actually, of a building, yeah, yeah, where you can stand. And I don't well, know, and wanna... when you're when you're when your quote unquote spiritual geography is the sewers, the street, and the top of a building. It certainly does its part to yeah. stand in for like a mountaintop, right? Mm-hmm. You know, um, but uh, so uh, let's see here. At this point, we could see we didn't get a chance to talk about Danny. Let's talk let's about just Danny do a quick, side before we side get to the quest final. on Danny. Yeah, side quest on Danny. A little side quest on Danny. So Danny is this well, other character. So if now. you have Casey Jones. <laughs> Yeah, it's just Which Dan. No, I love, my bad. That's just he classic. Grows up at the end. You know what? To be fair to the writers, they they kind of knew teenagers pretty late. Right? They have to do this sort of like. <laughs> and you have a teenage. You have two teenagers, right? I don't. Yeah, yeah. I do. So yeah. like, oh, I'm gonna go by this different name arbitrarily because yeah. I need to be my own person and have my own identity. Well, he's a he's a big boy. Now. But it shows us like, something, right? It shows the change from. No, the beginning it does. To, there's there's significance to this. There, yeah. Well, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Um, oh yes. Yeah. So go if ahead you have Casey Daniel. Jones, if you have Casey Jones as because of the character of this film, you you have the the virtuous Splinter and the Turtles. You have the evil Shredder and the Foot Clan. You have April O'Neil, who is this kind of like transcendent almost figure, Greek chorus type lady. And then you have the the true reactors being Casey Jones and Danny. They're almost like the human stand-ins for sure. For like I was the gonna audience, say, they're the know? audience. They're the viewer. The yeah, the audience surrogate, and you have them on two different paths, right? You have the person who doesn't have instruction, but he wants to do good, and he's out there trying to do the right thing. That's Casey Jones, and then you have the other human who is just sucked into the world, yeah, and he just naturally falls in with like the pleasure island seeking foot clan. Because his dad is at April right? O'Neil's antique shop too much. <laughs> yeah, I guess right. Um, you know, she never returns. Uh, Charles is, uh, you know, no, you can maybe tell. he gave her a key to his apartment, but she's not interested, uh-huh. right? Because just not she's that above all that. She's just not that. Well, it's into the power Charles, dynamic, right? I think. She's she's yeah. well aware of the power. And dynamic. then he fires her, and then he fires her because one of the things this, is, this pre- is like he's of the world, and the world is corrupted, and so he he is forced. He's like you're you're revealing too much light on this Foot Clan, and I got to put a stop to you, so you're fired. Because he's he's part of the machine, Mike. This is pre me too, he, so that's she can't uh, you know <laughs> go that route either. Yeah, right. Um, but Danny has an interesting, you know, Casey Jones has an arc. Danny has an arc, an even more explicit arc, frankly, than Casey Jones does, because he literally starts out just stealing from April, stealing from his dad. Um, you know, he's corrupted from the outset. He's become invisibly because. The people in his life can't tell, but we as the audience see that he's become part of this Foot Clan type apparatus, yeah. and he's working for them, and he's the one that betrays them, right? Mm-hmm. He he says, hey, I know where you can find these turtles, and gives away this in this Judas type fashion um, to you know the Shredder, the location. So he's the one that gets Splinter... Um, captured yeah. right but then it's by unlike judas right like he actually has this repentance arc where he meets the splinter he's judas and peter right? even though he's already betrayed together, him for sure yeah kind of yeah absolutely he's like judas and peter uh, and his name together. changes too from simon to peter now ah, it's daniel to danny to dan see? yeah it's true well yeah. because that's totally i mean to i'm be, telling you yeah, we're gonna he's a new person we're gonna get sure. there we're gonna get there yeah. but like uh yeah it's it's real um so he um you know he he betrays the turtles but then he sees like the beautiful way of Splinter, 
And he's he's finally able to see a contrast between like this hedonism and, that's been promised to and him and this like evil father. Specifically in the suffering that the crack and it's in, in the, the yeah happens. The, so it's absolutely. it's in the suffering servant. He sees of the injustice. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and, and he can tell it's ugly. He can tell it's unjust, and it speaks to something in his heart, right? And so then he becomes the person that helps save Splinter. And it's him and Casey Jones that do it, right? Mm. Because they're the two that are outside of, like they're the neutrals that are going through this journey. And their journey eventually coalesces together. And they're the ones, not the turtles per se, they are the ones that bring Splinter back from the underworld, right? Mm-hmm. And that's there's interesting that's, themes in all yeah, that. Yeah, no, that's you know? significant for sure. Um, and then, of course, as you keep giving away, by the end of the film, he's a new man, and he's like, "Now I'm dead," right? So he's ta- he takes <laughs> just, on the new name. I just I love well, I love that you included it because I had actually forgotten that until you you put that in the outline, and I was like, <laughs> "That's so just that's so classic." Like just gotta yeah, have a teenager yeah. go by a different name for sure. Oh, uh, and and then you know, and this is so explicit. It's so explicit. It's really like the moment I realized this was a movie about spiritual warfare. Is there's this scene where when Danny, it's like the fight for his soul is happening in the movie, and like he's he's like having a restless sleep, and like he's like rolling around, and like there's all these voices in his head. Yeah, and it's like the voice of Splinter, and it's the voice of Shredder. And they're literally like the angel and the devil on, on his on shoulder, shoulder and, sure. and he has to, yeah, and he's he has to make a choice. He has to decide which which Didache, you know, according to the Didache, which way is he going to take, right? Yeah, and he and that's what inst- that's what gets him to go try to rescue Splinter, right? Um, and you know, and then when Casey shows up, because Casey has had the exposure to like the right way and the true family, he's able to call them out. He's like, you call this family. Yeah. family you call this family and that's all he even says he doesn't even have to like say more than that you know and everyone including a young sam rockwell sam oh, rockwell gosh. is the is like one of the main you know pleasure island dudes in this movie he has like three lines throughout the course of the movie it's like his first he movie his credit start, probably yeah. yeah um but uh casey jones he calls them all out he says this isn't a family you know you guys are a joke and and they all they recognize it as true when he says it because it's coming from a place of authority well, because that's, like he, he's seen he kind of true. is the perfect person for that role because he's enough like them where he can almost be like i was you know similar to they you or almost like him. but he like you said he's obviously older and so he can speak to that sense of authority as well um I mean, they're pretty fickle, to be fair, but that's, you know, maybe that's teenagers for you. So <laughs> That's teenagers for you. <laughs> I should stop crapping on teenagers. <laughs> I work with them every day and I, you know, enjoy them quite a bit. Yep. That's also why I know them so well. So now we finally get to the the main climax the of the atonement with the father happening. and the apothe because that's the yes. hero's journey. Got to do the. It's atonement all with happening. The father, it all happens simultaneously. And so yeah. I love that we've and, sort of set up Splinter and Shredder as these father figures because this is where the atonement. Um, yeah, go mm-hmm. ahead. Well, and so they end up on the rooftop, right? Um, they get brought there because under duress, you know, it's like, uh, isn't isn't that how it goes? Or like, we have to meet the we have to meet Shredder here, or else there, he's going to kill Splinter or something like that. Was he? How does that was he going to threaten to throw somebody else off the? Now I yeah I mean all I See, can now remember, I can't remember how I they can just remember the, the pictures, but anyway. Yeah. Well. Hey, and because honestly, it, before we story, cap before why. we cap the movie and the conversation, I can't believe we skipped over their 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 enlightenment at the farm. We we just completely skipped we've barely, over that. Yeah, we've. I mean, we talked about the yeah, meditation. Yeah, like, we talked well, about the, he, the scene no, the but fire. like they're meditating, and then like he we didn't talk about the fire though. We never yeah. even got to it. So Splinter actually mystically appears to them. You're gonna make this our longest as a episode. saint. <laughs> <laughs> he bilocates. Yeah. No, uh, yeah, he bilocates. You know, uh, classic saint stuff, yeah. and uh, you know, speaks speaks to uh, them through the fire, and and that's when they get the resolve back, and that's when they return to the city because they've been spiritually nourished well, and refreshed, which through their father's passion. So, like basically. the the, I mean, sp- fire has always had spiritual significance for so many. You know, we we've talked actually, we haven't had our episode on fire yet, um, but we do have one planned uh, in in this podcast, but, um, you'll see this in a lot of mythology. You'll have like cultures that like, that's where they would gain their wisdom, where they would gain their insight or their enlightenment is by, and there was even, that was even a form of divination was looking into the fire, looking into the flames. And so it kind of fits that 
you know, mythologically that they would get that here too. I mean, not that they were trying to do some sort of like pagan element, right? It's just one of those things where Mm -hmm. it's like fire has to all human cultures has had this very strong spiritual kind of just, yeah, it it, it is like it, even though it's physical, it's something beyond physical. And Mm -hmm. so, Mm -hmm. so it makes sense that, yeah, it would happen in, in this case, the campfire at the, at the farm. But, um, so now <laughs> we can get to the end. <laughs> this is like yeah. the third time we've said that, I think. Um, but this time it's real. This time we're actually going to talk about the end of the movie. Yeah. Um, they're on the rooftop. Uh, Splinter shows up. And there's this, uh, you know, as, as is appropriate, evil ends up defeating itself. Yeah. Because, you know, this is the type of thing uh, where the turtles, they haven't matured enough, I suppose you could say, in their discipline to overcome this particular demon. Daddy's you know, got to fight coming the out. for him, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, the, the true, the, the person who's reached perfection mm-hmm. has to be there to undo the evil. And he does it, he does it not by fighting the evil. Mm. That's the thing. It's, it's Aikido, like he, right? Yeah, he he uses the evil ends up defeating itself, and all he has to do is just stand there. Uh, this is kind of a Taoist thing, mm-hmm. um, but like, uh, well, he he se- he confronts the evil though. He says, "Hey, I am confronting you. Like this is going to end." But then he allows the evil to defeat itself. I, I almost you know? would have loved if they'd have like planted a seed of like Splinter was trying to do Aikido with them earlier in the movie as sort of like a mm. foreshadowing. That would have been, I mean, sure, but. Uh, but yeah, it was perfect Like to go to what you were saying is that evil will eventually, because it is a corruption, it will eventually corrupt itself and destroy itself. And mm-hmm. so in this case, you know, we have Splinter, you know, I mean, 80s animatronics, getting out of the way, <laughs> getting out of the way. Super amazing practical <laughs> yeah. effects, I think is what you meant to say, yeah. Mike. Uh, <laughs> relatively speaking. So yeah, just, and you know, it was Shredder's like whatever. Um unbridled anger unbridled in the sense unchecked like unfocused yeah that it, gets him totally passion right and passion but there's you know? still mercy right because splinter yeah catches he doesn't him, even he holds he him, catches him catches him holds yep. him gives him another he's holding chance him of he's repentance. holding him above the abyss yeah he's like you know he's not trying to kill him he's not he, he's holding him above the abyss and what does the shredder and what do? does evil do it still it can't get over even this it can't help of itself mercy. And yep. he tries to attack, which is like, what did you think was going to happen when you let go? Of yeah, the it's it's the but most foolish, it. irrational thing ever. It doesn't even make sense that he does it, but it. Do, but you don't question it because it, it makes sense speaking, because he's yeah yeah he's off the speaking, deep end. It makes sense. He's lost it. Yeah. So now he's going to his his he's no longer a rational creature. You know, all of his discipline has fallen away. Right. All of the supposed discipline that the Shredder is supposedly embodying, this Antichrist figure, mm-hmm. is revealed for what he really is. Someone that's completely controlled by his passions. And so he attacks the thing that's keeping him alive and in so doing plummets to his death. Right. Um, and uh, ends up in a trash bin. It's very full circle places. because, yeah, you were talking about how this was the big controversy in New York was the accumulation of trash and well what is he he's just another piece of trash you know that's what the evil that's yeah. what evil is or that's well what... and it's like Gehenna right Gehenna yeah. is like the trash heap outside of Jerusalem right uh-huh. so like he gets sent back to hell and uh you know that's that's what <laughs> that's what happens like he he, he puts himself well, in hell in a sense basically. he experiences the hell that he had already kind of created for himself right and that's what I mean when it comes to like just Christian spirituality is that in a sense, God never like puts anybody in hell. It's like, we find ourselves there. God finds us there because we've made that decision. And that kind of goes back to, uh, again, this whole confrontation is he put himself there, right? This whole thing, both, both examples going after splinter, but then also trying to attack him even when the mercy was being offered. And so, um, in both cases, you know, he's the only one to blame for, you know, his downfall and i it's not it's yeah, not permanent absolutely. because there is a number two and a number three there is a sequel yeah. there is a sequel i think super shredder is, um so it was super shredder yeah in and new vanilla york. ice if, if <laughs> vanilla york. ice shows up go ninja go ninja go um but uh 
but if we're in the context of this movie, the story that's yeah. told in this movie, um, you know, it's it's pretty much to his death. But because honestly, Casey has a final like moment, you know, Again, gotta have that comic it's, relief. It's, it was getting a little it's, heavy. It's so. his. Well, it was his like kind of. Uh, this is he's not he's not perfect in his mercy. Yeah, <laughs> you know, unlike unlike Splinter, he's still on that path, and uh, so he just kind of oopsie accidentally like starts the trash compactor yeah. <laughs> in the garbage truck and crushes Shredder to death yeah. <laughs> in a gruesome fashion. Um, you know, but he does it with a smile. Which- you know. So that's a little bit of that pagan pagan uh, justice coming back through. A little bit, yeah. In his per- yeah. Um, <laughs> the king's justice. Little, yeah, a little pre-Christian, you know, anti-mercy. Um, but uh, yeah, and so that's that is the 1990s Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie by way of an allegory for the Christian life and spiritual warfare. Well, you know what, Jacob? I think you've converted me. I think... <laughs> mm-hmm. I knew I would. I knew I would. Because I, this movie's too good. I enjoyed... I enjoyed... Uh, <laughs> I enjoyed this conversation more than I expected I would and uh, found a lot more spiritual <laughs> fruit than I expected I would. Ah, so, yeah. And See, isn't that what matters? It. Yep. I, I was a doubting... <laughs> Uh, Thomas, and now I'm, uh, I don't know, I guess Michael, I'm back to Michelangelo. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah, there you go. Back to Michelangelo. Yeah. All right. Well, play us out, Mike. Well, we've, if, we've gone long enough, I guess. I, if you, if you actually want to hear more conversations like this, say specifically <laughs> that you want more of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles one, and I will reluctantly allow Dude, Jacob there is so to much do more we could another, talk about. The larger, the larger turtle universe leave, is crazy. Leave a five star review that says specifically you want more Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, <laughs> and. I, I guess Why do I you will. always do this with my episodes? Yeah. You always like specifically let us know if you want more of this. Because that's the only because... way it'll happen. That's the only way I'm going to do it <laughs> is uh, I will not do this unless I hear specifically. So, And like I said, okay. it has to be with a five-star review too. Uh, and then you can hear more of these conversations. Where And you know what? To be fair, I was a good, I was a good um, what did you say, dutiful student. I was like Leonardo. I, wa- I actually watched right. it again were... over the weekend and prepared nice. the outline so that we could and I know you had your portion too but we we, yeah. we both you definitely you got you to... you threw in some like quotes and then I had to make the real outline that's what actually happened here folks but it was my baby yeah it was my little baby turtle covered in ooze oh you want to be mutated sh- into a, for it, this one it, it mutated into a beautiful fully matured ninja of the sewers ninja mutant so that's the plan, my great leader. <laughs> I never got to do that one at the beginning. So. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for listening. Cowabunga, dudes. Thanks for listening to Voyage Podcast. The Voyage Podcast is a production of Voyage Comics and Publishing, which seeks to create exceptional entertainment informed by Catholic values that inspire people to live a heroic life. Voyage Comics seeks to advance truth and beauty found in powerful stories. To learn more, visit voyagecomics.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram 